welcome to Stand Up New York. A few friendly reminders as your show is about to begin. The restrooms are through those doors, left of the stage and down the stairs. Please silence your phones. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for James Altucher and his guest, Ryan Holiday. Thanks, everyone, for coming. And uh, we're going to have, we're going to talk, we're going to have a podcast, and then we're going to have some Q&A. And Ryan's going to give out challenge points to everybody who asks a question. So think of your questions along the way. And we're, we're here to talk about his book. Oh, I'll hold the real book. James Still has like the game. earliest possible copy. This is like before it was even. I edited. didn't think you were such a bad speller until I read this early copy. But now I figure you got you clean up your act pretty well. Yeah. So so I just want to tell one quick story. Okay. So when is this on? <laughs> when we first met, or around the time we first met, I gave Ryan what I thought was excellent advice, which is you know he had just come out with um, the book Trust Me, I'm Lying, uh, which is your excellent book on, on marketing. And I said, you should start uh, like a marketing agency, like this boutique agency, build it up to a few million in revenues and then sell it to uh, an advertising conglomerate for 10 million. And then you could do whatever you want after that. And I think you did it for about two weeks. Yeah. And then the next thing I knew you would move back to Austin. You basically had skipped my entire advice and just started doing what you wanted to do <laughs> instead of working to do what you wanted to do, which I thought was really smart because I spent 15 years trying to do what I wanted to do until I realized I could just do it. Yeah, I, I feel like life's too short to go do something you really don't want to do for an extended period of time so that one day, if you're lucky, you can, uh, you can have the opportunity to do the thing that you want to do. I was talking to this guy. He's a mutual friend, but I won't put him on blast. But he, he was leaving being an author. He was going to start like a, a VC fund. And uh, it's not oh. the person you think that I'm going to say. But uh, I, was, I was like, okay, so if this is really successful, if, if, if uh, you, know, you, you raise all this money, if you invest in these companies, you sell those companies, let's say you walk away with like $20 million. What, I was like, what are you going to do with $20 million? And basically, he walked me through this convoluted plan that ended with him becoming an author again. And I was like, you can do that right now. It's what you're already doing. And so I think people don't really think about where they want to end up. They just think they need to do all these things to one day have the freedom to do that when really you pretty much have the freedom to do it right now. And I think this is this is related, and but not necessarily related to your book, but I'll just mention, I think people have a hard time figuring out what is the, no, they think there's this imaginary number that they yeah. need to hit sure. in order to, do, to suddenly trigger like, okay, now my life is flipped and now I can do whatever I want. Yeah. And, and, and essentially most people like, the lifestyle they live, like let's say you live in any place in the U.S. and you make a hundred thousand a year, so you're living on seventy thousand a year. Your number is probably, if you like that lifestyle, your number is actually much smaller than you think it is. You just need to make seventy thousand a year on interest, and, sure. and maybe you work a little to to up up it uh, somewhat. But it's probably very easy for most people to piece together the lifestyle they want without saving twenty million dollars. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, or, or the thing that they think they need the twenty million dollars to buy is actually much cheaper than they than they think it is. Like right. you, can, you can go to the beach for a hundred dollars. You don't need to. You, you can go. You can do these things more cheaply and more affordably than you think. But people, people put it off in the future, and and then it never ends up happening. Right. If you think about it, right now you could watch a two hundred million dollar movie right on a movie a movie theater size screen in your apartment for a few hundred dollars, you can get essentially what used to be called slaves and now are called, you know, Grubhub delivery people. You get any food, any food cooked by a master chef could be delivered. It's as if that chef is in your kitchen, could be delivered sure. right to you sitting on the couch watching the $200 million movie. Uh, oh, you need prescription drugs? <laughs> Just call up the pharmacy, they'll send it right up. There's nothing. But somehow people are actually more miserable now than, than ever before. So people say that, and this now we're going to start to segue into it. Yeah. Is that actually true that people are more miserable now? Like people say that, but is it true? And how do you I define just mean, that? I, I just mean people for all of history thought if we just accomplish this, if we just get this, uh, w finally, like we won't suffer, we won't, be, we won't be unhappy. But the truth is the goalposts always, always move. There's this like famous, uh, there's this famous quote, some sort of 
very well-known British uh, sort of government official was talking to some American, uh, and this is right as America is sort of ascendant, right around the turn of the 20th century. And he's like, why do you Americans think if you just have this empire, if you just conquer these things, you'll be happy? And he was like, look at us. We have the biggest empire in the world, and we are not happy, right? And I think we, we think that if we can just get on this other side of the mountain, it'll finally be good. It never is. And, and this is true not only on the individual level, but I think this is true sort of like what does China think it's going to be like when they're the number one global superpower? I think they're going to find out that it sucks. It's probably better to be number two than it is to be number well, one. Well, here's the other thing. What, what is the fear of being number two? Right. Like there are probably many nice. countries that are kind of numbers two through 20 and they don't seem to be. Well, that and actually, different. most of those countries are able to be happier because they don't have the burdens of whatever being number one. Like Sweden gets to do whatever they want because they know that the other powers are taking care of all the tough stuff. Like the reason we don't have social, the reason that Europe has all these awesome sort of socialized medicine and all these awesome social programs is because like we pay to defend the world and they don't, they don't have to. We're getting political, but the point is like it's actually wonderful to to be number two because you don't have the responsibilities and the burdens of everything falling on you. Well, so now I will segue because this is related to so your book is Stillness is the Key. It's the third in your can you call it your Stoic trilogy? I would call it a trilogy, but not a Stoic trilogy. So so you have obstacles the way ego is the enemy. Now stillness is the key. Um, this one I I feel is the most. Um, this is the most uh, prescriptive. So ob obstacles the way an ego is the enemy, it were, I felt were books about looking at particular situations that were difficult uh, and kind of reframing them to say, here's how you find the opportunity in these difficult situations. This one is more prescriptive in the sense you tell many stories about all these famous historical figures and how when they moved from, let's say, overactivity, overthinking, even over philosophizing and just kind of found their own particular stillness, and you lift, list a lot of different methods to find that stillness, that that actually kind of created well-being for them and even, even success, whether it was monetary or political or, or whatever. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Like when you look at like who the main figure is in like all of the religions or schools, you look at Buddha or you look at Marcus Aurelius, or you look at Socrates or Jesus, they're like the same guy. Like, I mean, it's unfortunate that it's all guys, but like the the place that they got to, this sort of place of not being jerked around their, by their emotions, being very intentional, thinking very clearly, speaking very clearly, having a very clear sense of what's important and what's not important, having this sort of timeless wisdom. They're, they're, even though they're getting there in very different ways, whether it's Christianity or Buddhism or Stoicism or Hinduism, they get there that they get to the same place like there's no there's no like uh philosophical school where the the main figure is like running around busy and stressed out like the the, the key uh, the the end spot of all wisdom is some kind of stillness but, some slowing down but let me let me ask about that because it seems like in the modern world like take buddhism as an example and people who strive for Buddhism is almost like the opposite of trying to find any kind of normal secular success. And sure. yet, and, and the same with, with all of these, all of these religions uh, uh, and, and many of the philosophies you mentioned, in stillness is the key, you're, you're talking about s stories like ranging from John F. Kennedy to Mr. Rogers to Martin Luther King and, and many other people. These are people who did have secular ambitions. And so how, where does it come into play? Like it's almost like Eastern philosophy and a lot of these religions that recommend almost like, you know, there's a detachment. The mind. That, that, that I think is the fundamental problem with the Eastern philosophies and why they, they, they don't totally resonate with people and why I don't think they're, they're quite the right fit for the world we live in. Because look, it's easy to find sort of stillness and peace when you uh, are in an ashram in India, or you are on a 30-day silent meditation retreat in a beautiful monastery in the hills of Japan or something, but that's not real life. And, and why I tend to write about the Stoics and why I think they're the sort of school most, we live in a, I was looking at some Twitter thread where they were like, the reason roads are a certain distance apart right now is because like 
that's the distant, like the, the width of a road is somehow descendant from like the, the width of roads of, of the Roman chariot. Like we live in a world, railroad tracks are a certain distance apart because this is a certain distance apart, ultimately because like that's the roads that the Romans built. So we live in a world that is like descended from ancient Rome. We don't, we don't live in a world in which I think Zen Buddhism or Confucianism, as important as they are in the East, it doesn't totally track because there is this kind of detachment from the real world. Like, so if you think about Buddha's story versus say Marcus Aurelius, I'll get a little nerdy. Buddhist, uh, Buddha, if he is a real person, I think he probably was, is a prince. His father is the king of some sort of small country. To seek enlightenment, Buddha has to renounce his, uh, the, the throne to which he is the heir and he goes off into the, into the wilderness and he, he seeks enlightenment this way. So he, he achieves enlightenment by leaving the world behind. Marcus Aurelius is the opposite. He wants to be a philosopher, that's what he's doing, and then he's chosen to be emperor, and his greatness is that he fuses the two together. He becomes the emperor and he's practicing philosophy while leading the largest empire that the world has, has really ever known. And so I, I love the idea. To me, that's the fundamental contrast between Stoicism and Buddhism is that one is renouncing uh, the, the action in the real world and the other is saying that actually, no, that's how you achieve enlightenment. And so, so with, with Buddha, it's an interesting story because obviously he's revered worldwide. Uh, the philosophy, you know, millions or billions of people, both East and West, subscribe to it or subscribe to some aspect of it. But on the other hand, like you mentioned, he had to leave his wife behind, leave his Yeah, child. I found he that to be very dark. Dad. Like, yeah, yeah. He, and then, but then also, he... That doesn't of, sound like enlightenment to me, by the way, <laughs> that you walk out and your wife and kid right. to seek enlightenment. To me, that's a, a paradox. Like, that doesn't work. Or it's a contradiction. But then, then also, he has to... You know, as you mentioned, he's related to the, the royalty of one kingdom, but all these different kingdoms were at war with each other, and he's in the middle trying to just survive. So he had somewhat of a stressful life just trying to navigate that. And sure. But, that, he, you know, Buddha's not living in a house, right? Yeah. Like, Buddha doesn't have a job. Like, Buddha isn't doing any of the things that we have to do as people. So I think there's a lot of insight there, and clearly I tried to build the book around uh, uh, all sorts of insights from Eastern religion. Uh, Confucius is more interesting to me because Confucius was a uh, a political advisor. He sort of went from kingdom to kingdom. He was he was more like a Seneca figure, where he's he's uh, integrally involved in the power politics of his time. And so, as much as he's talking about these things philosophically, he also under he's also seeing that human beings are flawed that human beings have ambitions, that people go to war with each other, that people kill each other. So I, I find, I find uh, Confucianism a, a little bit more sort of a bridge between, you know, it's, it, on the extremes, if you have Stoicism and Buddhism, uh, some of these other schools are sort of right in the middle. Well, you, you mentioned uh, Taoism. To, yeah. Just to finish the, the Eastern yes. component, you, you mentioned Taoism quite a bit in the book as well. And there's a lot of argument we don't know if Lao Tzu was a real person, and there's right. a lot of argument that maybe he was a political advisor just like Confucius, because the whole book can be reframed as political advice as opposed to spiritual advice. Mm -hmm. And so there it strikes me as much closer to the yeah. concepts you're talking about in stillness. I think so. And so, so when we first spoke about Stoicism, I think it was 2014, it was right yeah. after, that's when Obstacles the Way came out, I think. It was yeah. 20, so, and you mentioned to me something very interesting, which is that this is a philosophy that was equally attractive to Epictetus, who was a slave, and Marcus Aurelius, who was an emperor, or Seneca, who was a wealthy merchant. Sure. And I thought that was an interesting concept. Like, for you, what is Stoicism in today's day and age? I'm going to ask just the basic, naive question. <laughs> yeah, so to me, Stoicism is a philosophy for wherever you happen to be in life. Um, it's it, Whether you're living an awesome life, or as was much more common in the Roman Empire, you somehow the dice roll and you're in a shitty situation. Stoicism to me was this philosophy that was designed to help you get through that or to, to live your best life. You know, there's a lot less uh, social mobility and agency in a society that has slaves. Like, thankfully, that's not where we are now. But like, um, doesn't people are still born into all sorts of circumstances that are not ideal, or they're born 
fat or they're, you know, they're born short or, you know, they're born this or that. And so they're struggling to figure out like, how do I make the best of whatever I've been given? And to me, stoicism is designed to help you sort of optimize from there. Like, so the four virtues of stoicism are courage, which we know is important, uh, temperance, so moderation, we know is important, um, justice, doing the right thing, we know is important. And then finally, wisdom, like intelligence, education, uh, understanding. And so as a philosophy, those four virtues are true, whether you're uh, true and imperative, whether you're the emperor or whether you're struggling at the, the ultimate, like sort of lowest point of the food chain. And I think what stoicism is there to do is to sort of give you a, a framework or a rubric for how to act, how to live, what standard to hold yourself to, sort of wherever you happen to be. So, but sometimes, and this relates to everything from you've written from Obstacles the Way to, to this book, Stillness is the Key. Sometimes you can say that, like, okay, I'm gonna live by my values, I'm gonna live a life of integrity, blah, blah, blah. And then, as the great Stoic philosopher Mike Tyson has said, uh, everyone. Everyone has a plan until they're hit in the face. Yeah. So, like somebody could be thinking, "Oh, I'm, gonna, I'm focused on the yeah. now. I'm living a stoic life." I'm, and then their wife leaves them. They lose their job. They're angry. They're depressed. They don't know what's happened. They're afraid. They're really scared. And then, how, like, if you're in that point of fear where you just don't know what is happening in your life and you don't know if things are ever going to be good again, what would what would be the first steps mentally you would take to sit, to to bring yourself? back to that stillness. Well, I think that's what, what is so interesting about stoicism is that you know, Buddha, we don't really know any like sort of real things about him, right? Like we, we know these sort of anecdotes and stories, but he's not, it's, it's just long ago enough that it, it's hard to relate to that life. So, but I think Seneca is so fascinating. So Seneca is like this senator, he has a good job, he comes from the right family, he's powerful. And on totally trumped up charges, he's exiled from Rome. He's exiled to this like shitty island in the middle of nowhere. And he's miserable. And so he obviously wants to come back. This is not the life that he wanted for himself. He's, he's this sort of well-known philosopher. He's this, and, and so finally they go, we know you want to come back. You're welcome back, but here's the catch. Like you have to be the tutor to this kid who's going to be emperor. That sounds like a great job, except for that kid is Nero. And so Seneca becomes Nero's teacher. And it immediately becomes clear that like, there's a reason that they offered this job to this person who was willing to, like, who they knew would have to say yes, because it's a really awful job, because Nero is, like, insane. Nero is, is Donald Trump, right? He's, like, uh, uh, deeply insecure, deeply egotistical, uh, deeply in over his head. Um, Are you getting political? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, uh, uh, obsessed with being liked, but being deeply unlikable at the same time, right? I could go on. Uh, and, and, then, and then you're sort of deeply corrupt and, and deranged in some way. I, I, again, I could go on. Uh, but, but so now Seneca's like stuck in this predicament. Like he wrote about how a philosopher only does what's good. And, you know, um, uh, but, and, and so he wrote about all these things in theory. And now his day job is to like show up and work for this guy who's like plotting to murder his own mother. And, and, and Seneca, I don't think, does a perfect job navigating this, as, as I don't think any human would be. And so for a long time, I think he's in this interesting situation where he's like, well, if I don't do the job, somebody else, maybe the job won't get done, right? Like, or if I don't do the job, someone worse will replace me. And this is like something a lot of people in the Trump administration have talked about, right? They're like, I felt like my job was like taking papers off Trump's desk so he didn't like pull us out of NATO, right? Like people, so, so it's this complicated thing where like you're sort of complicit or active in something you disagree with, but the real world is complicated and you know like if you don't do it, it's gonna happen anyway. And so it becomes this, he's sort of stuck in this really difficult position. Ultimately he ends up deciding to leave and Nero's like, it's not that simple, I'm not gonna let you leave. And also Nero is like piling him with gifts. Like Seneca becomes like the richest man in Rome by nature of this service. So it's like his ideals and his profession are in conflict with each other. Ultimately, I think as sort of a cautionary tale, I mean, it ends in his death. Like Nero has him killed. But to me, what I, I, I think it's so easy to be glib and it's so easy to think like, 
and, and I think this is where philosophy has failed, that it's so academic. It's like, of course you shouldn't do this, or you know, of course it should be like this. And the reality is the real world is complicated and we struggle to make these decisions. And I think as a philosophy, and I think this is what we should be studying history to do, is like to help us navigate these tough situations. So you can imagine though, Seneca taking this job, this is not a peaceful job. And he would have had to be, he would have struggled quite dearly to, to, to wake up every day and deal with what, what must have been a horrible job. So I, I think stoicism is, is, is there for precisely those kinds of situations. And that's what philosophy is designed, not for the classroom, but for the very real and vexing moral dilemmas that people have in, in life. Yeah, and I think, I think people, I think the common path people take is, and maybe this is a cliche to say this, but they go to college, they get the job, they get promoted, they get hired somewhere else for a higher salary, and then at the end of the day, they're retired, and that's it. They, they somehow sure. succeeded in life. But what's, what's the relationship between this stillness and, and stoic philosophy and ambition? So, yeah. so Seneca clearly had some ambition, but was it probably too much? Line? Is yeah. it too much? Is it too little? Well, so uh, you've seen the movie Gladiator, right? Mm -hmm. there, there's a scene at the beginning of the movie where Commodus is like, his dad clearly, his dad, Marcus Aurelius, clearly knows he has like a shitbird son and it's not work. And, and, uh, and, and Commodus goes like, you know, father, you, you told me what the virtues were. And, he, you know, he's honor, uh, sorry, justice, wisdom, temperance, courage. And he goes, but, and I don't have any of those virtues. And he goes, uh, but and Commodus in real life was like even worse than Joaquin Phoenix character plays like and do, is killed by a gladiator in real life. Um, but uh, he um, he goes, but I have other virtues. He's like, isn't ambi isn't ambition a virtue? Like I have ambition. Um, and and the the subtext is like, no, that's not a good virtue. But but I think what what they're talking about in the movie and what Marcus really talks about is like, it's good to want to be the best at what you do it's maybe less good to want to be the number one at what you do. So does that, does that distinction make sense? So like, like Marcus talks about like, so he, he goes like, sanity is tying your ambition to your own actions. Insanity and unhappiness is tying it to the recognition from others. So, so, so if maybe another way is, is he saying, okay, being number one, that's an outcome. Yes. That's, that's, that's an external, externally measured outcome. Yeah. Whereas being good today, what can I focus on today to be better? You're focusing more on the process than the yeah. outcomes. Like hitting the New York Times bestseller list, that's uh, an outcome outside of your control. Writing a really great book is something you control. Discovering something in science or making some breakthrough, that's in your control. Being recognized in the form of a Nobel Prize, that's up to the committee that decides who gets the Nobel Prize. Being uh, you know, an expert in constitutional law, that is uh, uh, in your control. Being admitted to the faculty at Harvard, not in your control. If you think about all the people who haven't been hired there over the years because they were Jewish or black or women, right? They're, so there's, there's the, the accomplishment of the thing that, uh, sorry, the, 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 accomp the part of the accomplishment that depends on other people, as you say, choosing you. And then there's the fundamental craft or ethics uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the, the process. And so it, I think the stoic focus is totally on this. And, and I like the Nassim Taleb thing where he goes like, you know, uh, making enough money to afford a BMW, that's up to you. Like making enough money to afford a private jet depends on hard work and luck. And so the stoics are like, the luck part, since it's outside of your control, is not worth anything. The only part that matters is the part you control, which is the work and the, the craft and the process. So that's kind of how I think about it. So ambition, it, as long as the ambition re remains the part of it that's up to you is valuable. As soon as you, as soon as you hand over your definition of su success to an outcome that's beyond you, that's misery. So like having a great podcast, great. Being number one is dependent on an algorithm. And, and, and I think you can break this down in any field. Like the, the, the recognition that most people are chasing in their field is fundamentally not up to them. And then this is why they wake up and they're frustrated or they're upset or they feel discriminated against or screwed over because they've handed 
the definition of success over to someone else, and it turns out that other person doesn't give a shit about you. Right, so I agree. When you, when you kind of like outsource uh, success to some committee's uh, determination, that could, that's a problem. But let's say you're, 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 you're in the middle of it. You're in the middle of the war. Yeah. And you know, the outcome's very important to you, it seems, when you're in the trenches in the war. And yes, you could do the best you could do today. That's all you can really do. Um, but it's hard to kind of, it's sort of like th this muscle of stoicism you have to practice in advance of that moment. Of course, like with quite the, a bit with with this book. So it comes out. It came out today. But I like I'm not perfect at it. I don't think it's possible to, to the stoic ideal is you're totally indifferent to externals. Maybe that's possible with a lifetime of work. I'm not sure. Like for me, it's like I'm I'm proud to say I'm 80 percent like like let's say that the, the success uh, is a there's a hundred percent. There's a hundred points. I would say I've taken 80 percent or 80 of the points off the table as success before it's out. That's from knowing that I, I, I put all the work I wanted to put into it, that there's not, I couldn't have done any better, that um, I said what I wanted to say, that I got the privilege of, like all the part of, I got, let's say 80 to 90% of the way there. And then now I'm on, I, so let's say I'm blacklisted the day it comes out or it, 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 very conspicuously does not get the spot that it earned on the list. Or, you know, we thought sales were going to be X and then surprisingly they were half X. All of the, that would affect me, but it, it, I'm not going to live and die by it. And it's not going to determine the majority of the, the happiness or opinion that I have of the thing. So it, it's like you start at zero, you're totally dependent on external validation. How can you work your way up so you're getting most of the way? I bet like, Obviously, you care about how many downloads the podcast gets, right? But you've probably gotten to a point where what you're most happy with is like, did you have a, did you have a really good show? Like, did you really get someone you wanted on? Did you feel like it was a good interview? And the, you care how many downloads it did up to a point, but it's not the majority of how you derive success from the experience. Well, you, I, for me, I sort of feel like you have to have a, me a metric of determining what success is. So it could be this external metric, how many downloads did I get? That's one metric. For some people, it's how much money did you make? Sure. Because that, that's somewhat correlated, supposedly, to the value you created. That's supposed to be the, the, the correlation. Uh, or it could be, oh, I felt really good about it. This podcast was great just because I simply felt good about it. And you sort of trust your inner compass enough to know, you have enough experience to know when something feels good that you that you say, yeah, this was good. This is how I want to feel about it. But let's say you're you're starting at zero. You're you're you know have a family, have responsibilities. The, the job is making yeah. you unhappy, and you don't know what to do. And you're you're angry. Maybe you're a little bitter. How do you start wonderful. practicing? And it, and it's not an unusual yeah. case study. How do you start thinking in terms of? Huh, this book is this book stillness is the key. It's interesting. I'd like to start living my life like Mr. Rogers and many of the other people to discuss in the book. <laughs> yeah, I think I think you want to start, I think you want to start with like best practices. That's where I like when I really look at sort of elite performers in any field, um, they tend like so one one principle is they don't actually seem to be that motivated by external results. If you look at someone like Nick Saban, like the best college football coach in history. He seems more unhappy when they win than he is when, when they lose because like, he has a much higher, st he calls this to sort of his inner scorecard. Um, he's like, I am judging us a, a, against what we're capable of, not like what the score says. So uh, we could be losing and I could be happy and we could be crushing the other team and I could be unhappy. So that's just one principle that you, when you look at really successful people, they actually are not usually that motivated by external results. But I also look at like other practices that these people have, and I talk about it in the book. But I think generally this is a good thing. What what are the what are the people that you really admire that are sort of best in the world at what they do? What what practices or habits do they tend to have? I tend to find they're very routine based, right? They're not waking up and like, what am I going to do today? It's like they know what they do every day, and that's just how it is. I think routine is really important. Uh, I, I think when you look at most great creatives, there tends to be some sort of uh, walking practice. They seem to walk a lot. They go outside. They, they are not always doing. They take time 
to sit back and reflect. So I think walking would be a good one. You tend to find that they have some spiritual practice or purpose in their lives. Very rarely do the people you really admire uh, turn out to be nihilists, right? Because why would why do it if you think it's all meaningless, right? I don't think that's uh, I don't think that's a good one. So I, I talk about that in the book. I also think uh, I think one of the most pra one of the most um, deeply personal ones that I talk about a lot in my work is there's some active meditation on one's mortality. So like I wear a ring, it says memento mori, and on the inside it says, you could leave life right now, let that determine what you do and say and think. And the idea being, most of the people you really admire do not take even a minute for granted. They're not thinking like, oh, I'm gonna live to be 80. They live as if they're on borrowed time. And this, this sense of borrowed time allows them to be productive, it allows them to prioritize what matters. It allows them to, to seize every moment. And I think it also allows them to be quite grateful for the time and, and, and privileges that they do have. So I think what you do is you, you look at the people you really admire, not just for the outcomes, but the people who seem to be handling their success well, who seem to have character that you admire, life that you admire. And you try to back out from there. What are what are principles and practices that you can replicate in your own life? And I feel like what I try to do is I try to look at those things and then see where they overlap with the sort of stoic practices, and then that's that's what my books are. So, so you mentioned in all your books, and I love how this book interweaves various stories from uh, political history, sports history. Again, even I'm just fascinated by the Mr. Rogers story. I never thought yeah. that would be... Uh, my my favorite childhood. I was I was show. much more excited that when I was writing the book because I started writing the book in 2017 and this is like before the Good Neighbor book came out. This is before Tom Hanks was going to play uh, Mr. Rogers in a movie. This is before the documentary. So I really felt like I discovered this like totally new side of this person, and it turned out like everyone was sort of onto it at the same time. But I do think he's a super fascinating. Like I think if he was Catholic, he would be a saint. I think he would be like on the track to be a even just the idea that he was like a Presbyterian minister, Episcopalian, I forget. But like the idea that he was a deeply religious person and you could not tell one ounce of that from the show, but that he felt like the show was the best way to sort of witness and teach the principles that he believed in. I think it's just like an incredible, I think he's just an incredible human being. I mean, do you feel that way? Do you feel like you writing these books is this way to get this message out that you s so strongly believe in? I mean, I can't think of another reason to write books. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, if you're in books for the money, like you're in the wrong business, <laughs> right? And if you're if if you're in books to be famous, you're also in the wrong business. Like, uh, you know, you should pick something else, right? And so, I think ultimately, uh, you you've got the only reason to write a book is because you have something deeply urgent and important that you feel like needs to be said. And I think. It's because of something we were talking about earlier. I won't give away what you were talking about. But I feel like you got to do the thing that only you can do. And so I feel like I'm talking about, I think it's interesting, you know, uh, so I started writing about stoicism when really no one was interested in writing about stoicism. Like my publisher wasn't like, oh my God, we can't wait for a book about an, uh, an obscure school of ancient philosophy. And now I think it's interesting now that the books have worked, all these other people are writing about it as if it's like the hot thing. To me, that's a really crappy reason to write about anything is that it's the hot thing. You should write about it because that's, that's what you deeply believe as a person. So I wouldn't compare myself to Mr. Rogers, but I do feel like I'm writing about this because it's all I think about and all I want to talk about. And who do you, I mean, who, who were your personal inspirations but, you know, as you started writing this series, as you were writing this book? That's a good question. I don't know if I was really modeling it on any particular book, but um, I think Robert Greene, as a person who who takes stories and uses them to teach lessons uh, that that he feels like people have lost, I, that was certainly a, a big model for me. So, and I and I could see definitely Robert Greene's. I feel like you have a softer touch. Like he. He'll get he'll dive really deep into someone's history and then pull the meaning like super deep, like into the weeds. Whereas, think, whereas you're kind of you, you, you're not assuming any knowledge from the reader. You'll you'll kind of skirt through the main points of the story, find something that's interesting. I think in 
a lot of judgy language in no, no, no. Us. No, I actually, but but yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, but it's it, it's very similar to Robert Greene style in some way that you're taking these historical uh, stories, you're you're finding what you value in those stories and then bringing it to life. Well, so which like he this, does in his, this book in his took own. Like two two and a half years. Mm -hmm. Robert Greene's last book took I think seven years. So I think Robert is going to like a, a DNA level and he's going so in depth and it's like each chapter is like hundreds of books that he's read. It's incredible. And so I think that's why he's the, the best in the world at what he does. I feel like what I'm doing is, I think my books are, I think his books are like the definitive take on X. And what I'm trying to do in my books is present kind of like an introduction to X. And so I'm trying to introduce people to a story or an idea or a thought, and then you can you can go read all the source material. So I, I just think we're in different lanes, but he is always like the the to me like the bar that I'm comparing myself to. And and when you're writing these, I want to is okay. I want to get into the writing process okay. a little bit. Yeah. So it seems like you must read like a thousand books for this. You take notes. I'm just guessing. Yeah. You probably take detailed notes on each one, and then find. The, the things, like you said, that no one's maybe heard before or or nobody's heard with this particular twist on it. Yeah. And then that becomes a possible entry into the book. Yeah, I think it starts with some idea, like some theory or argument that I want to make. So obstacles started with this argument that like, what if obstacles are actually opportunities? And that, that's sort of how the greats of history have thought about them. Or ego is this idea that ego is this kind of cancer that's eating away or undermining whatever it is that you're trying to do. And then this book is this idea that stillness is the sort of common theme between greatness uh, of all types, and, and it's the common thread between all these different philosophies. So I have this argument, and, and, and once I have this sort of germ of an idea in my head, then as I'm reading and studying and researching, and also obviously referring to the research that I've already done, just generally, I, I start to notice sort of sub headings of that idea. So, um, you know, what are examples of people doing that? And, and, and I try to find patterns. And then I'm I, I, like, this book is like 32 chapters, right? Or something like that. And so what I'm doing is, it's here's my argument. And then here's sort of 30 sub arguments that illustrate that argument. And I'm looking for stories that illustrate the principles that, that people are going to hopefully remember. Uh, let me just ask, why are you holding up Mike? Oh, right. Is my mic going out? Yeah. Oh, great. Ooh, sweet. Oh, one okay. with a cord. Is that, do I need to turn it on? Better? That's good. Do I turn this one off? No, you're good. Okay. Cool. It's dead. So do you ever feel like when you're looking at these stories, do you find that you, um, what's it called in statistics, when you fit too closely? You're like, using the, con what I'm essentially doing is using the confirmation bias to my advantage. Like, right? like take, take the example of John F. Kennedy in yeah. the Cuban Missile Crisis. Yeah. Uh, you know, at first, I wasn't sure where the stillness yeah. happened. Then you explain it, but I was just curious how you kind so of like so. So the argument. So let's say I'm uh, okay. So I'm writing a book about stillness, and then I've decided that I'm that at, from generally from my reading that there's like different types of stillness. There's a mental stillness. There's kind of a spiritual, emotional stillness, and there's a physical component too. So okay. So now I've I've, I've got a sense that's what I want to do, and then so a lot of this is sort of gut. Uh, and, and intuition, which is why you need all that practice. Um, and and you, you kind of have to have a sense, like uh, I think Plato talks about this. He's like, how can, you, how can you find what you were looking for if you didn't already know what it is? Like there's this, there's this weird sort of philosophical paradox that we must already know everything or how could we recognize it when we find it, right? So there's like this sense you kind of generally know and so, like, so, I, so, I'm sitting down. I'm going, okay. I'm, I want to illustrate what mental stillness looks like, and I kind of just flip through in my mind, like, what are examples that I'm vaguely familiar with that illustrate this potentially, right? And so, I, I thought, well, I kind of like think about the. I was like, what are the stakes of the Cuban Missile Crisis? That must have been interesting. Maybe I was thinking about it because politically, we're now like, I, I don't think that could ever happen again. Um, and so I was like, well, maybe Kennedy, the, the idea is not like, I know Kennedy is the example. It's more like possibly he could be. So I'm going to go read a book. And I read 
Is my mic still going out? Yeah, yeah, that was that's great. great. Um, so I, I thought maybe there's there's some idea that Kennedy could be, and so I'm reading Kennedy. So I, I start reading books about the missile crisis, and then I'm, it, my hypothesis has been somewhat confirmed, and then I go really deep in it until I find it, which is kind of what you learn as a research assistant. What Robert Greene would do is go like, I want to talk about this. I think there might be something here. Go tell me if there is or isn't. So I would have to go do the sort of unpleasant work of like sifting through something or, or going down a lot of dead ends. And so the Kennedy thing turned out to be right, but I could have been, I could have found out, oh, actually, when you study the missile crisis, he proves the opposite of mental stillness, or um, you know, it, it turns out it's too complicated or muddled that doesn't work. So you're kind of just looking for it. And what the weirdest part though is you have this sort of general idea, and then you just tend to bump into things that end up working. So so along the way, until you, you got yeah. here, you sort of uh, took a very alternative path. You you sure. instead of finishing college, you were head of marketing at American Apparel. Then I, I think you worked uh, with Tim Ferriss, you worked with Robert Greene, you worked with Tucker Max, you worked with all these different authors and, and, and thinkers. And uh, was there ever a point where you sort of said to yourself, ugh, maybe I should have taken the, nor the quote unquote normal path? Like, like at what point were you ever stressed enough that stoicism wasn't enough for you or you didn't have enough where I don't think I was ever like the normal path because I really don't like anyone telling me what to do like I really like so I'm fundamentally like not cut out for like having a job like I don't like uh having to dress a certain way I don't like having to show up a certain way I don't like having to go to things that I don't like going to so there's like a, a just a a sort of I'm not like a a total uh contrarian but I just I just don't like it when I don't get to decide how I'm going to do things. And so that, I think, ultimately sort of determined that at some point I was going to have to work for myself. So there, there, was, an, there was a time where I could be a research assistant for a while. There was a time when I could have a, uh, like a professional career. There was a time I could work with clients. But it was going towards a place where ultimately like I had to, like now, now, sometimes like I'll go to DC, I'll have meetings, and it's like, they'll have to wear a suit. And it's like my whole life is built around me not having to wear a suit. So it feels, it's like very, I'm like an, like I'm like an outside dog or something. Like I, I'm not familiar with the way and, and I really don't like whatever the constraints of being like an inside dog are. So, so okay, so let's say you had to give three prescriptive ideas, maybe one physical, one mental, one spiritual, in terms of what's something people could just go and practice to get have more stillness in their life? Yeah. Okay, so I would say number one is is some form of journaling. I think taking a quiet uh, time to clear your mind, ideally at the beginning of the day, um, where you put your thoughts on paper and you're able to reflect on them from some semblance of a dis uh, of a distance. I all the time I feel like I write something in my journal. I'm like, do I really think that? Like, did that just come out? That's like awful. But it's the process of getting it out that allows me to process it and move past it. And, and this is not journaling for the purpose of later publishing it. This is just. So it's not a diary. Spewing. Yes. This is a, a, it's a process. Like if you think about what meditations is, Marcus Aurelius' work, he had no idea this would ever be published. And a lot of the ideas in it are not original. It's the process of writing them down and, and reflecting on them that's so valuable. So I think journaling would be one as the, so let's call that the mental practice. The spiritual practice, I would. Um, would be a good example there. Uh, I mean, I, I think some some uh, some serious meditation on like why we're here, where we came from, what this all means. Because I do think if if you do if you think it's all meaningless, if you think uh, you know this is all random chance, if you think you're in complete control, uh, I think you will be rudely surprised right i think that's an awful but let's way say you do think it's random chance well then i would i would think about how what does that random chance actually mean so like what this the stoics version of a higher power is a sense of the logos which is the idea that like the vast majority of what happens to us is outside of our control and so our fundamental choice in terms of free will is like are we going to get dragged unwillingly or are we going to happily go along like their their analogy is like we're dogs tied to a cart um, the cart's going where the cart's going to go. 
the dog can lay down and be dragged, or the dog can sort of cheerfully uh, jot alongside, right? So I think just some some serious spiritual work. Like when you, re it, I don't think it's a coincidence. I'm I'm I think as part of the, my work in this book, I went from being an atheist to being agnostic, right? Which is actually a huge distinction. And an atheist says like, I know there's no God. Um, which I, I just, in retrospect, it's, it's, it's not a surprise to me that 19-year-old college Ryan was able to, to read one or two books and be like, I know that God does not exist, right? Um, I think it's also ridiculous to be very certain that you know God exists. I think they're equally absurd positions. My point is, like, I got to a place where I just don't know. And what I, what I, but what I do know is that something is happening because there's some movement, like there seems to be some something and that could be this idea of the logos it could be the universe it could be random chance it could be higher power it could be any of these things but like i'm going to have some humility in the face of this sort of great unknown right okay and so so that's a, a, that's a mental practice was was the journaling yeah. spiritual practice is some reflection on you know what do we do in a universe where almost everything is out of our control yeah if we want not quite happiness, but well-being. Would you say there's a distinction between happiness yeah. and well-being? Yeah, or, or and there's certainly a distinction between like success and sort of spiritual purpose and clarity, right? So there's lots of people who have lots of money but are utterly miserable because they don't have any idea. They, they think that the money or the fame is what's going to, the happiness will ensue from there. But like, I got to I gotta think that... Uh, I, I almost envy the sort of quiet, humble happiness of religious people. And, and, and I wonder why, you know, Naval talks about is like, if, if you're successful, but you're not happy, how smart are you? Do you know what I mean? So some work on sort of spiritual health, I think would be one. And then the final one though, I think, uh, how, does this, how does this manifest itself in practice? So I think, um, I guess I would talk about, I talked about this a little bit earlier, but like I, I go for a long walk every day but it doesn't count as exercise. So I don't think about it for its physical benefits, even though it's a physical act. It's the, it's the, the clarity that comes from the movement that's very valuable. So I go for some long walk. This is where I think, this is where a lot of my ideas happen. This is where I sort of try to practice gratitude. Uh, I think some active uh, movement throughout the day is very important. And ideally, this is done outside, not on a treadmill in your office. You know what I mean? Like this is, and it's not in a parking lot around your office building, right? This is like in the woods or on a nature trail. This is some sort of experience or exposure to something bigger than oneself. So la last question for me, and then we'll have some Q and A. When you're in a plane and it's packed, do you put your, recline your seat all the way? I would never recline my seat on an airplane because I'm not a fucking monster. <laughs> Um, but people always go like, but if it, if, if it wasn't okay to, to, to recline, why would they have the button? I mean, you can do anything you want just because it's, it's allowed doesn't mean it's okay. Right? Like I, you, I could, one of you could put your feet up on this table right now. That's not like explicitly forbidden, but it would be a horrible, rude thing to do. And so what I always think about are like, what, what's the externality of my action? So like, if, and they go, but if I recline, if I recline my seat, they can just recline their seat. And it's like, what a fucking awful logic for your actions that because you did something rude to someone, it's okay because they can just pass this rudeness on to the person behind. So I'm very staunchly uh, anti seat recline. Uh, I'm I'm also anti. Um, <laughs> I'm 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 anti a lot of things on planes. Like obviously the person in the middle seat has access to both armrests, right? Um, you know, th things like this. I, I think very strongly about it. You should write an entire, not a book, yes. but like it would be a good article, like your all your a stoic thoughts on airplane etiquette. Well, I, I think the problem with flying is that you just realize that like most human beings are like utterly selfish and like <laughs> completely incapable of empathy and just like also generally like quite stupid. Um, and, 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 and it's sort of like the worst of humanity all, uh, you know, trapped in a thin metal tube with each other. <laughs> Q 
Q&A. And then, <laughs> don't forget, for every question, you get, what are the, what are the names of the coins? I think we have a, an Amor Fati coin and a Memento Mori coin. And what do they mean? Uh, so Memento Mori, we talked about, it's a meditation on mortality. And then Amor Fati is this idea that, at the end of the day, no amount of arguing is going to change the fact that people are going to recline their seats on our, on airplanes. So you have to, you have to. Well, oh, so this is a great, great point yes. that, uh, in terms of opinions, yes, like it almost seems not really worthwhile. It's okay to to have an opinion about what you would or wouldn't yep. do in a situation, but it seems like not worthwhile to basically think strongly about any one opinion to the point where you have to argue it. Yeah, of course. Like, I, I mostly, I, I, like, I'm never going to confront another person about them reclining their chair because that's, like, their decision. But I'm going to... Be going up and down the plane, loser. <laughs> right. Because, because, at the core of it, because of my opinion, it's going to determine the one thing I do control, which is, like, what action I'm going to take. So... They're going to recline their seat on on me. I'm not going to let it get to me, and then I'm not going to pass. I'm not going to. I'm just not going to continue the problem. And I feel also that that's a good way to practice. Of course, uh, uh, I think this is a metaphor for life. Like uh, people are going to do awful things is not an excuse for you to be awful. And in fact, uh, all all you can do is just be a, the opposite of what you know you think is awful. So. Questions and Ryan will have answers. Oh, and we'll we'll repeat any question you say. Yeah. Uh, Ryan, what's the biggest pain point of making a Um. Yeah, that's a good question. So he's asking what changes I've made in my own life as a result of of the the research that I've done. I would say journaling is a big one. I always sort of thought journaling was be nice, you know, it'd be cool. I sort of admired people that did it. And then really realizing that as far as practicing the philosophy goes, there's really no philosophy and, or sorry, stoicism and journaling are the same thing. All the stoic texts we have are this process of meditating on the same ideas from different angles over and over again. So I think that's a, that's a big one. The memento mori practice would probably be the second one. This idea of like, you know, I think most people in, instinctively, reflexively, do not want to think about the fact that they're going to die. It's scary, and it, it it threatens. It's like in the legal system, you're like jury nullification. If you know what that is, is like the thing no one can talk about because the whole system collapses if you can just like convince a jury that the underlying law is not important or or somehow unethical. Like the system has to like take things for granted. It's almost as if, as a human species, like if we think about the fact that we're going to die kind of feels like it renders everything meaningless. I, I actually think it's the opposite, that death is what um, what gives all of this some end point. Um, it, it's what creates prioritization. It's what creates purpose. And so I, it's something I try to actively think about and, and, and never, as Shakespeare said, every third thought shall be of my grave. I don't know if it has to be that common, but I do think it, it, no day should go by without you going like, today was it. Would I be good, uh, or am I leaving something on the table? I, I'm just curious, just to add to that question. I find if you think about death in the ways you've always thought about your whole life, it, sometimes what I mean is if you say, okay, I'm going to die probably within yeah. the next 30 years, that feels like a really long time. But if I say, if I try to look at it in an unusual measurement, like, oh, I'm going to see my kids only six more times before yeah. I die, because now they have their own families and I'll see their own yeah. families. Or, or if I say, I've only got 30 more summers instead yeah. of 30 more years. And why, why do you think that happens? That if you look at it in an unusual way, it, it feels more real. It's because we get used to, it, it sort of it, it sinks into the background. And, and what because it's so uncomfortable, because it, it so requires us to change, we try to think about it always the same way so we don't have to. The, I think the most powerful way comes from Seneca. He goes like, we think that we are moving forward towards death, that death is in the future. And he says, no, death is happening. All the seconds that are ticking by right now or that have already happened, he's like, that time belongs to death. So instead of, uh, instead of thinking that I'm going to live to 70, so I have 40 years left, I think 30 years of my life are already dead. You know, and and so that that actually death is this thing that's happening right now as I'm talking. Seneca says we are dying every day, not that we die in the future. 
to me is like a way, a sort of a wake up call way to think about it. And a great way to encourage everybody to order another round of drinks <laughs> yes. from the bar. Yes, of course. Uh, you had a question. Well, what? Oh, well, let her ask because she's, uh, I call her. Yeah. Friend. Okay. Okay. And what's the second one? Sure. All right. So her question is: Is how much does the where the the where the facts go sort of in the research shaping? Uh, what you're saying, or how much is it you sort of already have the sense? And then she's asking sort of my personal fascination, how that affects things. I think what it, you start with a hypothesis, but it can't, It, you know, there's this idea, I think it's from, uh, who's the Freakonomics economist? Uh, Levitt, Stephen Levitt. Levitt. He's saying uh, strong opinions weekly held. So you have some sense, but you have to be willing to discard and change that based on information. Like a, a, a scientist has a hypothesis, and then they go, they seek both confirmation and disconfirmation in the hypothesis. So that's what I'm doing when I'm, I think I know, but I'm willing to let what I find shape it and control it. But ultimately, I'm writing about what I think is interesting. So the personal fast, like you can write about anything. I only want to write about what I'm, what I'm struggling with or I'm interested in or I think is, is important to right now. So that's the, ultimately the filter, what you include or don't include. Um, Oh, yeah. Who had the question back there? That she's she's paying her bill. Oh, uh, okay, sir. Yeah, what's your question? Oh, no. First, I'd like to say this is right in time to five years. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you she was a flight attendant for five years. Was he? Is Ryan dead on? <laughs> but um, also, I appreciate you. But the thing is, I am a Republican. I don't appreciate you going why, why would that possibly offend you? <laughs> yeah, I also think he's a fucking moron, and it's totally my right to call him a fucking moron. And if you called someone I like a fucking moron, do you, do you know what that would mean to me? It would mean nothing, because it's your opinion. I think the more you like and first you're just in your book platform, to bash the president, and that's not fair. Okay, first off, it's to it's totally fair. He's not. If I if I wanted to, I would. Ask anybody around here. Ask them what. Ask them what. Should we be the speaker? That you're using your book. That I'm using my book to say my opinion. That's like literally the definition of fair. <laughs> and that me, a tiny regular person, would write about literally the most powerful man in the world. That's how is that unfair? How is it how is it unfair for a private citizen to express their opinion about the person who literally commands the largest army in the fucking world? That's like the definition of fair. You're using your book platform for this. For what? But, for my opinion? Yeah. That's what my platform is for. That's what why, why would I, I I get this email all the time from people. They're like, how dare you say your opinion? It's my opinion on my platform. Why would I? Why would I build an email list? Why would I be able to write? Why would I write books if I'm not going to use it to say what I think? Your book is about still. My book is about whatever the fuck I want it to be. <laughs> that's why. That's why my name is on the cover. Let's so do think, another question. I think. I think though. I think though, the point is there's got to be ways for people to express their opinions, even if you disagree with them. So. I think that's the, the definition you know, also of compromise and freedom of speech and a lot of things. I don't agree with everything Ryan says. I have, I'll just say an example. I've had the same business partner since 1999. I'm pro-choice, he's pro-life, he's super pro-gun, he's super religious, um, none of these things. And we've never once had an argument even though we've talked about all of these issues. So I think it's, I think it's healthy to have 
discussions about these things and be able to freely express your opinion without worrying about it turning into uh, a fight or a joke or, or whatever. That's, that's why we have voices. So, all right. And, yes. Oh, that's awesome, man. Thank you. Sure. So he, he's sort of asking about like how do you find balance with, with these sort of extremes of either being too negative or too positive, too happy, too. Un I like uh, Aristotle has this idea of the golden mean, and he says that every virtue lies in the midpoint between two vices. The Stoics didn't totally agree, but I, I think it's a great concept. So courage being a, a virtue to the Stoics, Aristotle would go like, okay, so on the one side there's cowardice, that's an absence of courage, and then on the other hand there'd sort of be rashness. Uh, or, or, or foolhardiness, this would be an excess of courage, right? And so courage is the right amount, like true courage is not having absolutely no regard for your own safety, and it's not uh, such a, an obsession with your own safety that you're unable to risk things. So the idea of, of balance or this middle ground is I think a really important way to think about it. So this, I don't think, that for, for me when I think of the Stoic, I don't think of someone who has no emotions, I think of someone who has an even keel, sort of in any and all situations. So, so to extend this question though, uh, and I, I, I'm sorry if I interrupted, mm. but it seems like that's what makes stoicism quite rightly difficult to practice. Of course. Because like, like you mentioned before- well, if it was we, easy, what value would there be in it, right? right? So, so like you mentioned before with Buddhism, it's one thing to just renounce your entire life and live in a cave, yeah. it's sort of like that's almost this safe way to, to provide you this solution to yeah. take an extreme. If you look at Greek philosophy, if you want to think of like stoicism on steroids, is like cynicism, where they yes. essentially do take the nihilist view. It's a rejection of everything, yes. Right. And so, so, so how do they, how, like cynicism, I would say, is more like Taoism even than a little stoicism. Bit. It's, it's incompatible with like a normal life, right? Uh, the the like Diogenes, the famous a famous cynic philosopher, he like lives in a barrel, he masturbates in public, he like is off the grid essentially. Hashtag me too all the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so I don't think that I don't think that that works. Like it, it, I think you want to think about how does this scale? What if everyone was like that? It would not it would not be well. So so I think what the the, the Stoic it, it's it is a little bit about middle ground. Um, that I think the Stoic is thinking like. Yeah, what what would happen if everyone what would happen if everyone did this and and trying to find a, a balance there? Yeah, and so so in in other words, that's part of the practice is finding. Yeah, it, it, I really like what you said before about find what you have control over, find what you love. Yeah, find out you know, and and that takes trial and error. But then find out what you have control over, find out what you don't, and focus on the love part. And the part that you can control, yeah. and somehow that's going to find your your stoic middle ground to answer your question. And and the Stoics actually have an interesting middle ground towards because some of the early sort of more cynical Stoics are like you know money doesn't matter, fame doesn't matter, power doesn't matter. We should sort of renounce all these things. And what Seneca sort of helps crystallize, he says actually there's good things and there's bad things, right? Like bad things is like being a liar. Bad things is being unethical, bad things, uh, you know, whatever. And then good things are the virtues. And he said, but then in the middle, he calls them like preferred indifference. So he's like, money is a preferred indifferent. Like, obviously, not having money doesn't mean you can't have a good life. Having money doesn't mean you automatically have a good life. But if you think about it, you'd probably rather have money than not have money. He's like, it's better to be tall than short, right? It's better to be rich than poor. That doesn't mean it's inherently a good. It, he just calls it a preferred indifferent, which to me is like a way to split the difference. Like you would, you would rather have it if you have a choice, but when you don't have a choice, 
you don't let it affect you. Which is why I think it's important to practice in advance. Yeah. Like most of the time, you don't really need to know where the gray area is. But yeah. to practice in advance the things you were describing, the other things you describe in this book, for instance, to write this book, you had to negotiate the deal for this yeah, book. Yeah, sure. So, so you not only want to be Maybe a great better writer. to have more control over it than less control, but if the situation was whatever it was, you would make the most of it, right? And that, that's sort of the idea. So the Stoic is like, I want it, uh, ideally it's this way, but I'll make do whatever way it happens to be. And, and so that to me is a position of flexibility and adaptability that you need. And I think that's a critical difference between what you're saying, which feels very spiritual, very even like Eastern philosophy, but at the same time, there's this very practical aspect, which is you're not saying the world is an illusion, everything's meaningless. Yeah. You're saying there is no self. Yes. Right. You're saying kind of we don't know, and that's fine, but here's what I do know. I love writing. I want the best possible reach for my book. I want to be able to do this. So I, I can't control if I'm going to be on Oprah, but I can control or, or sure. try to control the negotiation, and I can certainly control the, the material in the book. That's right. Uh, so, so now we're going to have a, a book sign. Ryan's in, two, two things. One is Ryan's going to have a book signing for, for how long? It's around eight. How long is the? So Ryan's going to do a book signing for a half hour. And then everybody who has a ticket to this automatically has a ticket to the 9 p.m. comedy show here, which you're all welcome to come to. Are you going to perform? I am going to perform. There you go. <laughs> but now, now I'm going to have to make up a whole bunch of jokes about airplanes and stoicism. So... I don't know what I'm going to say yet, but you're all welcome to stay for that. And um, yeah, where's the book signing going to be here or OK, right there. Perfect. So thanks very much for coming to this podcast. <laughs> Give it up for Ryan.